tuned in to the Cosmic Combos Podcast, your number one source for accurate, relevant, and thought-provoking astrological conversations in the podcast nation, the place where stars and minds align. Peace, you're now tuned into the Cosmic Convos Podcast. I'm your humbled host, Herut, and we got the man of the hour, Brother Ra. How you doing? Oh, brother, you know, enjoying enjoying the day, brother, enjoying the year, enjoying life, man. That's about it. How about yourself, man? Hey, man, same thing, man. Can't complain, you know, a little, maybe a little sleep deprived a little bit, but, you know, we all good. <laughs> for sure, Indeed. for sure. Yep. Um, But before we go any further, I want to remind you all that this episode is brought to you by Push It Forward Media Group and Calaprusha Astrology. Um, You can find Push It Forward Media Group on Instagram at Push It Forward. That's P-U-S-H-I-T-F-W-D. You can find us on the web as well with that same spelling. That's the Instagram handle, pushitforward.com. Um, up there you'll find this podcast uh, we got some short films coming we got you know a bunch of interviews articles things like that um you know on that on that website and everything and um, um brother Rob, how do you um how do everybody get a hold of you and Kyla Perusha uh, yeah Kyla Perusha astrology at gmail.com best email for a source to get a hold of me and then you can hit me up on IG or Facebook at Shechem Ra. Uh, both of them have the same tag, so you should be able to find me pretty easily on either one of those as well. Good deal, good deal. And don't forget to follow us. Follow this podcast on Instagram at Push It Forward. I mean, not at Push It Forward, sorry. <laughs> at Cosmic Convo. That's uh, C O S M I C C O N V O. And that's on Instagram, and it's the same way on Facebook as well. Cosmic Convo, follow us. You know, you know, shoot us some DMs, get in the comics, ask us questions, and uh, we'll definitely answer them. Indeed. So yeah, um, here we are. We at um, episode twenty three. That's uh, that's pretty heavy duty, man. You know, that's a, that's a heavy commitment. <laughs> Indeed, man. What you think about that? Yeah, it is a commitment, indeed. Uh, you know, it's um, it, you you think that you just sit down and do something, and you know, basically that's what we're doing. But you know, a little forethought, you know, a little looking into things takes place, and so you know, with all the other things that you do, it definitely takes a commitment and dedication to continuously pump them out. So, you know, we're gonna be here for a while, but. Uh, I'm thankful that we could get this far and uh, and end on a nice 25, you know, on the number 25, that's a nice number to end on. So if we do it like that, we're going to have them building up real quick, real soon. Indeed, indeed. You know, we go ahead and wrap up this season and, uh, you know, um, end the year with a bang and then get geared up for the next season, season two next year with a, with a you know, with a new, with a, with a whole new vibe and, you know different you know angles and different things like that you know um yeah it's been it's been a um it's been a definitely a learning experience and uh you know just real interesting to see how everybody engagement you know all our, our listeners the the comments that they have and stuff like that um it's, it's been um definitely a good time indeed indeed so um let's see we um I didn't get a lot of questions, but we, we just, you know, got a lot of, um, you know, inquiries. And I think we could probably slice some of these, some of what, you know, the feedback we've been getting in this uh, episode that we're about to get on. Um, that's somebody, you know, um, this is a Western astrologer. And, um, you know, they're always referring to the outer planets and, you know, speaking on how um, a lot of... Um, you know, astrologers of Joytis doesn't use the outer planets. And they um, actually have put up an article about um, Pluto and Pluto's role in the decline of um, re, um, marriages and also divorces since the 80s. Um, and they uh, specifically cited um, Pluto going into Libra um, causing this. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know we we we're not gonna go super deep in that, but you know, what what just you know, you get a a quick little answer on how you know we use Pluto and if you know um, there's something to what they're saying. Uh. When you look at astrology, um, you have to really kind of take an understanding of um, it's not just looking at a planet and seeing its effect. Astrology is much deeper than planetary placements and all those things. This is what we use to gauge certain things. Yeah. Right. But that's not the end-all, be-all of astrology, right? It's just not. Um, And so you have to understand man and consciousness. I don't want to get too deep, right? But when you understand man and consciousness, man's development is within stages, right? And so these stages are literally set up and structured by certain... um, uh, planetary algorithms, if you will, right? When you look at man's life, his life is allotted 120 years at best, right? So 120 years, really not that long. But it's enough time for Saturn to make three tra- three returns, Uranus to make one return, Right? Jupiter to make seven, eight returns. Mm -hmm. So when you understand it from that perspective, then you ask yourself, well, then how do the outer planets play a role? What do they do and how do they work? Well, Neptune and Uranus are planets that are far outside of the lifespan of man as far as their uh, their transits and their period of returns right because a return means just that you have to in order to experience something you have to experience it enough times to understand it even Uranus is just one return so Saturn gives us three four returns right you know Jupiter gives us like I said nine turns yeah nine returns so these planets influence the development of man as an individual but man as a whole or totality is based on the higher octave planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And when I say man as a whole, I'm talking about the um, development of man from a grand scale. Yeah. And so then we can employ, because now we're talking about generational patterns, which is different. And he is right to a degree. So, yeah, as a she. Or she, excuse me, yeah. I'm sorry. It's all good. No, no disrespect. <laughs> um, so, when you understand this, right, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, how long does it take for Uranus to move through a sign? It takes seven years. Yeah. Right? Then you can begin to see the generational differences every seven years. It's literally there. Neptune takes 14 years. So if you've noticed, we've talked from jump from 7 to 14. Isn't that phenomenal how the octaves are happening within 7? Yeah. Right. So now we have a planet that takes 164 years, 14 years per sign on average to make a trip, to move to one sign. So now, you know, if you're 20 years difference, you know, Neptune is going to show that within this 20, basically 14 years, Right, this leap of consciousness has happened in generations. Meaning, that's why we have generational difference. That's why things don't repeat themselves over and over and over. That's the outer planet's role. Now, now, so every fourteen years, we can look and say the next sign will be coming up for Uranus and so forth and so forth. Now, Pluto takes twenty-one years, <laughs> right, to transit <laughs> one sign. So by the time Pluto has transited half of the Zodiac, you'll be dead. Mm -hmm. By the time Neptune has transited three-fourths of the way, you'll be dead. 
So you don't even get a chance to experience as an individual the, the reciprocal process that happens when you create a circle, which now creates a loop, which creates a circuit, which creates connections in the brain. Right? How do we move from this to this? The brain is built on circuitry. Right? The planets are the different parts of your spirit slash body slash mind slash brain. So these all play out. So every 21 years, you might notice a small difference. Of course, you're going to notice a difference because Saturn is working with you individually. But as it comes to Pluto, you're not going to really notice the impact unless it's really conjuncting a planet by degree. And I yeah. say that that does happen. But the other planets still filter in and do their thing. So it's almost it's in the background. Right, unless it's right at that degree, then you'll experience some of those um, in, um, uh, propensities with regards to the outer planets. Like my moon is conjunct Uranus one degree, right? Mm. So it makes me pretty decent astrologer, right? But it also gives me I deal with a lot of special women. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I swear to you, right? Like Uranus, I get I'm like whoa. <laughs> I get it, Uranus. I see it, but that's my. It's within a. De- I mean, literally, it's almost less than a degree, but I rounded it to a degree, right? So when you understand that, then you can begin to see. Okay, it does have some impact, but it has to be such a tight degree. It's it's unmistakable, and it's not something that's completely just overt. It's subtle, right? So when we talk about that planet moving from into Libra, Jupiter, and Pluto's into Libra or whatever. Uh, that's when they noticed these different things. And it more than likely was in Virgo, right? Um, for that period of time, for a slight period, or for an expanded period of time. Um, you know, and Pluto's in Leo before that, and then Pluto's in Cancer before that. So are we attributing Pluto to the de- de- decline of the divorce rate because over 21 years he was in Libra? Because only 21 years, if we're talking about 21 years, we have to look at. 42 years because you can't look at that sign and say well it just happened it 21 years is a long enough period where you should see a a, a serious impact yeah so the using sidereal astrology pluto was in virgo and well, what is the, the sign the... of divorce um it's not libra Would it be Mars? I mean, not Mars. Um, Aries? The sign of divorce is the house that takes away from the house of marriage itself, which would be the sixth house. Okay, the sixth I can house see that. is akin to the sixth sign. I can see that. Right? The seventh house is the house of promises and vows. When you break a promise or a vow, that's the sixth house. Mm. Okay. So the breaking of a promise, the breaking of a vow, the breaking of a contract is the sixth house. So it would make more sense that Pluto would be with his powers being uh, reconstruction, uh, destruction, um, corruption, um, 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 an upheaval type energy in the house of divorce, a sign of divorce. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. See, Pluto is on it's the sign that it's in is going to tell what it's doing or how it's doing it rather. And and the the house that deals with things breaking up is the sixth house. Dig that. So yeah. So looking at that, see, um, so Pluto pretty much was in Virgo during the seventies, mm-hmm. and then in the eighties is when it went into um, went into Libra and left in ninety three. So. If it's that, and that's sidereally, I'm sure. Yeah, so sidereally. That, that still kind of lends credence mm-hmm. to what I was saying. Because if you really pay close attention, it happened at the end of the 60s. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right? If I remember before anything, you know, I'm, I'm a 70s baby, so I'm born in the 70s. So the generation before, the people before me, Right, divorce. You just and and thinking about this, but people before that, you didn't divorce. 
I mean, you, you did, but it was kind of like an unheard of thing. Like, you know, it was kind of like not the thing to do in the 50s, 40s, is what I'm saying, 30s. You know, you stuck together, especially the African-American community. I mean, we didn't really, you know, our community, you know, grandma, papa, and mama all stayed together. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And they might have had some serious issues, right? Well, why Papa would sleep down there? Oh, he sleep down there because that's where Papa would sleep. You know what I mean? They worked it out, right? Before then, and they kind of carried it over to the to the generation when they passed. But the newer generation, remember we talked about generations, right? That's what said it leads credence. So the generations in the seventies and the eighties, right? It was a it was it was a free for all. I <laughs> mean, you have to if you look back and you know things. He, I mean, there is some credence to what he says, but I wouldn't say. Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, I'd have to agree. It is generational. It's generational. You're not going to see it on a very specific scale, but generational, you will see divorce, especially in the sign of Virgo, and of course, in carrying on into Libra, and then Scorpio, and Scorpio is its so-called natal sign, and yeah. so. I mean, in fact, it's just been on a on a down, downward spiral since then. I mean, yes. I mean, look at the culture we're in now. I mean, and, and, and Pluto's in Sag right now. So you can see all the things that are happening with spirituality and your religion. Things are getting busted up. Indeed, things are getting yeah. busted up. It, they're getting busted up every which way you turn. Right? So it's like, you know, you can see it. You know, religion is definitely being... Um, transmogrify <laughs> you know, because people <laughs> people are not buying it anymore i mean yeah. they're just people are waking up and so it's kind of a um a dual edged sword because people are waking up you know what i mean but then you have the same time those old you know pluto deals with old 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 habits right yeah. so you know when you deal with those old habitual ways and it's time to blow up you have these kind of um splits if you will and i've seen it even in my family like okay i was all christian i was all spiritual <laughs> and so there's like a line draw yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. so you know you can see it you know and when pluto gets into capricorn we're gonna see major big business fall mm. it's going to change right because the internet is killing it yeah yeah you know, internet is killing it I mean, look at Fortune, right? major companies. I mean, I'm just looking at over time how many companies have just folded, just left and right. Big companies like Kmart and uh, um, uh, I can't think of the other company. I mean, I, thinking, I mean, they they fold, and so when yeah. Pluto gets into there, man, that's gonna be quite interesting, and we'll be able to witness it because it's about to it in a, a couple it's years. It's gonna change in, a, in in some years. Yeah, we'll be alive to see that, but nonetheless. So, yeah, I have to say he is correct. Or she is correct, excuse me. She is correct in that regard, that um, the outer planets do influence generational things. But remember, she's saying that it's in mass. She's saying that the divorce rate, which has to be measured over masses of people. Mm -hmm. So she never mentioned the per particular individual that we're talking, because that's different. And then that's where you lose a lot of the power in predictability and also... Um, uh, analytical ability as far as breaking down a chart, you just lose power because it's not, the, the planets don't work that way. They have to be either one very close to a very specific type degree in the chart, and the most important degree is the degree that you are born under within your ascendant. That's the most important degree. So if it's on that degree, absolutely, you're going to see it. If it's conjunct the moon, absolutely, conjunct the sun, absolutely, even conjunct any other planet by degree. I'm going to keep saying by degree because some people, some astrologers say within three degrees. I don't say that because yeah. I haven't seen that as a consistency. It works sometimes, but I'm telling you, if it's by degree, you know that is going to be an influence in that person's life, depending on what area we're talking about. So, you know, but uh, to the caller, to the to the listener, uh, I do agree with you in that regard. That yes, uh, generationally, absolutely, we can use the outer planets, and I do. You know, and you can't really do mundane astrology, which is what we're about to talk about now, without it. Indeed, indeed, and just, just, just real quick, um, Pluto goes into Capricorn February twenty first this year. 
I mean, oh, 2020. So this year. Yeah, I thought it was next year. Right. Yeah, twenty. It, well, next year, twenty twenty. Yeah, February twenty first, twenty twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's what's up. That's what. Then we'll see the beginnings of the fall of um, major powerhouses in the world. Indeed. Um, so uh, we're going to jump into some those uh, planetary expressions here in a minute, um, so we can really just get down into understanding how they work on a mass level and use uh, an area um, so that we can really see what they do. Right? Indeed. Indeed. Uh, especially in the climate right now. Um, the topic, a lot of people are, you know, wondering about this different thing. So I think this show would be um, pretty practical for what's going on right now. I would agree. So what we're doing tonight, folks, is we're going to discuss mundane astrology and an application within that form of astrology because there's different forms um, within the same construct of what we call sidereal astrology some people say Vedic some people say Jyotish which is the proper term um, some people say Hindu some people say Indian whatever your preference it's all the same this is what we're talking about yeah but in that s spiritual science of astrology or in this science um, what we're doing is exploring <clears throat> a folk, a type of astrology that allows us or lends us to see what's happening in the mass, uh, in the masses as far as the world is concerned, right? And so, it's not individual astrology, right, or uh, Chikata astrology. It's it's called mundane for a reason because it's dealing with the world at large. So, <clears throat> in this form of astrology, right, we look at um, different the, the ways that planets are going to express themselves within the construct of a chart of a nation or a leader. And we'll talk about how that works in a little bit. But when we're looking at this, the planets themselves in the sky are always kind of going to have a story to tell and kind of reveal what's going on at the moment if you're paying attention. And that's why I continuously say I don't understand how people could use a certain type of form of astrology because if I'm looking up, it should lend credence to what I see on the ground. Right? And so when we look up, the first thing we want to begin to notice is when planets are in positions that are triggers, they're, they're, we call them triggers because they like it's like a it's like a, a slingshot. You pull it and then it moves past, and boom, there's an event. And so, the major triggers we always look at. The first one we always look at is oppositions. And in dealing with planetary factors for war, oppositions are the ones you always go to. You would think it would be conjunctions, and it is to a degree, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well, but oppositions are just what they say. They're something that's opposite to one another, which you'll be, you'll, you'll be pressed to find that the seventh house, which is what an opposition is when the planets are in the house and opposite from itself, which would be the position of the seventh house from it. The seventh house deals in war, Okay. The seventh house deals now. People say, "Well, what? I thought you said it was marriage. All is fair and what? And love and war." Okay, so right, you know that you do go to battle with your mate at some point in your life if you've been married. You oh, yeah. do this, right? <laughs> oh yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> right, this happens. Right, so you know when you understand the seventh house placement or the opposition placement it talks about your public enemies your open enemies right it deals with disputes right so when the planets are in the opposition they're in the seventh house position to each other that is a trigger to begin to notice ah so if i see mars is in opposition to this particular planet or venus is in opposition to this particular planet there is a there is a fight or something that is seesawing or going backwards and forwards 
and that you will see in the real world you'll see it in your personal life and you'll see it around you well when we're looking up we want to say okay or we're looking you know at our astrology um programs whichever you you i mean I, I try to do both but of course you can't watch the planets 24 7 but i still try to at clear nights i still get out as much as i can because i get up very early in the morning so I'm, st I'm able to see certain things as far as planetary placements and when you understand when you look at it visually you do get it it's like oh it's in opposition so there's something going backward or forward i'm in the middle right so oppositions are the first thing you look at second thing would be squares Right, and squares are minor skirmishes and subversions. They're not full out, full on, all out war. Yeah. Right. It's a square, so you're squaring, but you're not in. You know, you're not in the position of being opposite. So you're like you're cutting corners. On you're trying to cut the, the corners on that particular placement is trying to they're kind of trying to cut each other. So then it creates this tension, right? And then tension creates. Uh, minor skirmishes and then those minor skirmishes and attention which is fear-based creates subversions right and subversions are when espionage things like that and there's this, there's another placement I'll tell I can mention briefly um, it's called a quincunx in the western tradition and um, in the eastern or in the um, Jyotish tradition it's a 6-8 combination Mm -hmm. Meaning when planets are in the sixth and eighth houses from each other, they're meaning, and what that means is, in fact, you know what? We'll have a show on next season on um, on uh, planetary placements. Meaning, we'll talk about oppositions, conjunctions, squares, and quincunxes, all that. We'll have a show that discusses that. But for now, just take my word for it that quincunxes or, or six A combination also can indicate some skirmishes or some fighting or some some type of even even maybe even war but for the most part you want to look for oppositions the last one we want to look at is conjunctions and conjunctions also can be triggers because planets when they conjoin it's like igniting right something that is going to be explosive it's it's going to set off an event right it's going to it's opposition i mean conjunctions create new things right how do we know you look at a you look at a conjunction the same way you look at a new moon. Yeah, the new moon brings something new, right? Does it make sense? It does. It does indeed. So when you look at these things, right, you begin to say, "Okay, now I see it." So, you know, conjunctions conjunctions are like alloys, metal alloys. When you begin to research alloys, like steel is carbon plus iron. Right? It makes steel a new, that's an alloy, right? So right, when you begin to look at these things, oh, well, then a planet, these two planets create a new thing or a different thing, right? Now, moving into how this works, right, you have to look up. So when you begin to look up or look at the stars, look at the heavens, follow them, right? You'll begin to see that, okay, hmm, you know what, uh, I know Mars is in opposition to Venus at this current time. Not it, not, in, not now it isn't. Mars is about to conjunct Venus very shortly. Actually, it may not because Venus, no, it won't actually conjunct Venus. Venus moves too fast. But it's going to come close. They're going to be within a sign or so. Nonetheless, when you see, let's say, Mars is in opposition to Venus in real time, just pay attention around you you'll see on the ground where people will be contentious. There'll be lots of passion. There'll be lots of um, misunderstandings. There'll be lots of, um, I don't say arguments, but disagreements, right? When Mars and Venus are in opposition, but there'll also be this love-hate type thing you'll see around you. Yeah. So, you know, that's just to give an example that when you begin to look at planets in real time, you know, oh, yeah, well, guess what? If a person's born at the time that you're looking at that, they're going to have those propensities, right? You can be a witness to that. You just had a beautiful baby girl. So you, at the time she was born, there's propensities on the earth, right? Yeah. And there's propensities that she's going to reflect just as if it's like reflecting what's going on on this planet through her. 
Yeah. So, you know, that's why when we look at the, the sky or look at the chart or look at the, the planets as they move, oh, yeah, Mars oppos opposition Venus, yeah, that guy right there has a problem with women. Hmm. Mars in opposition to Venus, men have a problem with women. Straight up, every time. So, in the sky, as above, so below. That was my real point of, of saying all that. Um, <clears throat> so, but we want, you know, you want to look to see what's going on real time. Um, are, are there planets that are squared and what planets are squared? Is there a planetary war, which a real planetary which war is called Yudha in the Jyotish vernacular? That is when a planet, two planets are within a degree of one another, right? That's a planetary war, technically. What, that's the technical name for it. And so you even notice that those times, and that's a conjunction, right? So you'll notice that, you know, there's going to be some tension or some, some um, burgeoning situations that will occur around the energies that are focused through those planets. Yeah. So trying to get people to understand in the right brain way how, to, how these things work because they're actually creating a picture in the sky, right? And that picture then filters down to us and we reflect it through our animal, right? Indeed. So, <clears throat> um, the first planet we're going to talk about is, it's got to be obvious for most people that deal with astrology because the, the topic is, you know, mundane astrology, planetary factors for war. This is the process that we begin to look at in sifting the most important point to look at in all wars, all disagreements, anything, you have to know the, the planet that is the one, and that obviously should be obvious, Mars. Mars is the planet of war. Indeed. Right. And so most wars you're going to see, Mars is a big player. He just is. He moves slow enough to have a decent enough impact on other planetary placements because he doesn't move so fast. It takes him generally about two years to move through the entire zodiac, right? About 45 days per sign. Yeah. Right. So when you know that, you know that Mars is slow enough, right, to create challenges and issues. He's not like Mercury. He's not like Venus. And he's not like the sun. Those are the inner planets. And Mars is considered an inner planet. But he moves slower than them. And it's almost like if you really pay attention to the way the Netter created it, it's like a cop, like a police officer. <laughs> he moves slower than the inner ones to keep a close watch on the ones that are going in the inner circle. <laughs> right? He doesn't he, he moves fast enough to go faster than the other planets, like a cop should. Yeah. But he also moves slow enough to be observant so that he can see what's going on inside of the situation. Right? So it's almost like a police officer is sitting there going through the motions of right, exercising, you know, the law. Patrolling. Patrolling, exactly. So Mars is always the planet that we look to, and Mars's combination with other planets meaning in opposition, in, uh, in uh, conjunction or squares, those are the, those, that's what we want to see, right? We're looking for that. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> so you, you, know, you, just, you just look for Mars and say, okay, hmm, Mars in opposition? No. Nope. Okay. No, is Mars squared? No. Nope. Okay. Mars with anything? No. Nope. Okay, then there's nothing really cracking. Yeah. In the sky. But remember, we also have to look to other factors to see what might be a trigger with regards to a nation. And that's a little different. We're not talking about that yet. We will in just a second. So Mars is obviously the first big boy on the block. He's the one that is he's the jump off, right? <clears throat> not to say other planets can't. They can. And we're gonna talk about those planets in a minute. But Mars is usually something something involved there. He has a hand in it in some way. The next planet we look at is Saturn. Yeah. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. And so Saturn is the planet of strife, the planet of frustration, right? Angst, anguish, right? All those things that go along with not having or being deprived of, right? 
And so when we know that a planet that functions like Saturn interacts with other planets, it's going to put pressure on those planets. Right? That's what Saturn does. He creates pressure. He's a pressure cooker. He's a tester. He's going to make sure you either you live it or sit down. Right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. Because he deals in time. Right. So Mars and Saturn. Right. If they interact in any way out of those oppositions and conjunctions, you bet your bottom dollar there's going to be some wars abounding in the Earth somewhere. Right. Somewhere. Yeah. All right. Um, in 1988, the Afghan war was afoot. And, uh, you know, America had played a role, but Mars and Saturn were in conjunction, right, in 88. So that Afghan war, of course, you know, and there's so many different wars that have happened over the centuries. You know, of course, we can't explore it. You can, you can research till the cows come home, and, you, you know, you're always going to see some type of similar theme. But for the most part, you always have to find where these two planets are in any given war, Mars and Saturn. They will always play a role. Always. And especially when they're together or in opposition. Then you know you have something that's potentially volatile. Yeah. Right. The next planet, actually... I was going to talk about one first, but we'll talk about this one first because we're going to go in a different order. It's K2. Mm -hmm. K2 is a trigger planet. And I don't care what K2 touches. It will trigger something. Right? Whatever planet it is, it's going to do something. It's like having Oya in a chart. Right. Oya is the it's like a tornado, like a tumultuous wind. Right? And remember, tumultuous winds always have something in the what's in the middle of the tumultuous wind usually. Void. Peace. Yeah. Right. Dead silence. They say the what? The choir before the what? Storm. That's K two. Hmm. <laughs> When it's real quiet, still, dead even. And then, boom, that's K2. And then dead again. <laughs> right? Because, like, you know, after that tornado whipped through, it's like crickets. You can't hear nothing. Yeah. Not even a bird. Nothing. Right? That's K2. So whenever it's with something, <laughs> it's going to do something. And something is will trigger. It's like Mars on crack. <laughs> <laughs> On steroids, let's not use it. Steroids, right? Yeah. Mars on steroids, right? Because they say K2 is it's like Mars, Rahu's like Saturn. Yeah. Right? So K2 is like that explosive nitro. If, if Mars is dynamite, K2 is nitroglycerin, right? Mm. That's how you look at that. And so K2 and Mars, or K, let's say K2 and Saturn, it's going to be struggles, frustrations, um, starvations, things like that in the world. In fact, K2 is conjunct Saturn right now. But it's in a position that uh, it's, K2 is not in a position that it's there to harm. It is there to do things, but it's not necessarily there to blow it out. And plus, they're not by degree. They have a good distance from each other. Right? Yeah, yeah. But if they were conjunct, bet your bottom dollar, you would have those types of situations in the world. Starvation, hunger, um, uh, resources uh, diminished. I mean, just massively speaking. So K2, is, my point is K2 really is one that really does do a lot of damage, right? Let's keep it a buck. It's just going to do, not in a personal chart, but in... The mundane sense of things. Yeah. So, an example of that is, or happened on September 11th, 2001. Oh, yeah. And that's, you know, 
everybody in the world probably knows that that day, right? The one day that American soil witnessed, right, an attack, right, other than Pearl Harbor, right? So that placement was in the, the ascendant. Well, it wasn't the, the sign it was in, Sidereally, is Sagittarius, right? And I know a lot of guys out there, astrologers, people, I don't know if this Sagittarius thing is America's chart. Well, let's just look and see if the events reflect the chart. And they do. Yeah. All right. 9-11 wasn't, a, wasn't, I don't know, I know there's theories, and I get it, guys, like, it's inside job, I get it, trust me, we don't have to say nothing, don't, you don't have to send me anything, that's a horse that's been beat <laughs> many, many times, I don't have any, I don't have a dog in that fight, I'm not here to discuss that aspect of it, yeah. but I am here to discuss the actual wit, what is observable, and that is, there was an attack on America, right? And 9-11, whether it was staged or not, the planets themselves lended their powers for that event to happen. Because when you understand that K2 and Mars are in the ascendant of America, the ascendant itself is the physical country itself, meaning the country itself is going to be not the, the, not the farmland, not the foreign territories, not neighboring countries, right? Third house is neighboring countries, right? Yeah. Right, not the second house, right? Not the fourth, which is your homeland. The first house is the country itself, and K two and Mars within one degree on that day. Yep. Need I say more? Right, that shows that the physical country, the country itself, would be attacked. Hmm. So, boom! Right there, you can see Mars and K two at work creating planetary factors for war yeah right now moving on right now we'll talk about the other the outer planets the first one you want to take note of is uranus uranus can do a lot of strange things right it's designed to to shake up things every seven years right it shakes things up that's what it does so if it's in conjunction or opposition, possibly even a tight square, that means that that also can create wars, right? It also can create wars. It's designed to create revolution, right? Shifting, um, mass shifting of thought as far as paradigm shifts to a, to a degree, right? Yeah. Uranus, right? Because it's connected to the sign of Aquarius, so-called connected. And so it shows that Aquarian unorthodox energy, and it also deals in mass, as far as mass, the masses, groups, large organizations, and so forth. So when you know that, Uranus has that power to literally shift and change things in the world on the world scene. The last one we'll discuss is Pluto. Mm -hmm. Right. Neptune, not so much, right? Neptune is kind of like that backwater energy, right? <laughs> it's like <laughs> is not right an energy that is going to create something that would be tumultuous or um, destructive. Yeah. But Pluto, the planet par excellence that creates this in mass it's pluto right now we can talk about the outer planets and use them in a very intelligible way because man now we're dealing with man at large over large now we can deal with nations right because nations exist for hundreds of years in fact we're about to have a pluto return very soon here america is yep this year I mean, next year, next year, 2020. Right. I mean, well, it'll be 2020 and going on. Right? Mm -hmm. And ongoing, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you, think, if you think about it, it's quite a few years that this thing will happen. So Yeah, we're going to be old men. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, 21 <laughs> years from now, it'll leave the sign where it is. So, yeah, or, yeah we will be an old man. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so Pluto, you know, definitely is one you always want to look to to really see the propensity of war in a, in as far as the world is concerned and in a nation. In fact, Mars and Pluto were in opposition when World War II started. Mm-hmm. And Pluto represents weapons of mass destruction, right? That's what Pluto is. It is going to destroy so that something can be reborn, right? <clears throat> and so when you understand that, I mean, thinking about World War II, think about Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I mean, that's the, this is the effect of that planetary opposition between Mars and Pluto, the both both the planets that create this type of thing. So, you know, history will show you exactly what it is that's being reflected in the heavens. That is what we do. We are astrologers. Take it. Okay, here's the message from above. Where do I find it below? Yeah. Right? And if you don't find it, you have to go back and show, okay, well, maybe I'm not, oh, okay, yeah, I didn't, okay, this is that, and this is that. So you, you're you measuring as above, so below. You're going backwards and forwards to see the, the correlations, to see the connections. The last thing I want to discuss, and I could be here forever because there's many more things that we would need to discuss to really get a full view of how to really read war properly and how to predict it. Because Jupiter is also involved, too, in another back way, and so is Venus. But that'll be for another time, another show. Yeah. Right? But, nonetheless, a planetary placement we always can look to to see war in history is Saturn and Aries. Well, you know, one, one more thing for you. You move on there. Sure, right um, September 11th, uh, Mars is, and Saturn is 6-8 from each other. Then that even better shows that so that six eight position people are like what's six eight it means that when a planet for example is in the second house right that means that planet in the second house is going to be let's say there's two planets we have to talk about two the planets in the second house the planets in the ninth house counting from the ninth house to the to counting from the second to the ninth excuse me two three four five six seven eight nine is eight houses away so the ninth house is eight houses from the second and simultaneously the second house is six houses from the ninth so when a planet are placed in this two planets are placed in the second and the ninth we have they say it is called a six eight positioning and it can be in uh two nine it can be in three ten right it could be four eleven right and so forth right so if it was a if it was a six eight, Mars is placed in the ascendant. Saturn would have to be either in the sixth or the eighth house. Yeah, and Mars was in which sign? Mars was in Sag. There it is. Oh no, Mars was in Sag. Yeah, Saturn is. In oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Saturn. Where was Saturn? Um, um, Taurus. There it is. So eighth house. Six. All right. I'm sorry, sixth house. No, you're right. Excuse me, six, six, eight. So yeah, it's in the sixth house. So, and then the sixth house itself, in a chart, deals with enemies. Mm -hmm. It deals with so it deals with war, right? Just like the sixth house does, but in a different way, right? Uh, it deals with um, military, armed forces, right? The conquering things. Right? Yeah. And Saturn is there, so it means Saturn is sitting in the house of enemies. And so being in the house of conflict, and now we have Mars with the trigger, K2 automatically can open the door for an attack. Heavy duty. So it's written. These things are all written, right? We just try to find out how it's written so we can use it to co-opt and cooperate instead of ignore and turn a blind eye. So... <clears throat> Saturn and Aries, um, in six, between 68 and 71, and the Vietnam War started in 55. Um, so it, the Vietnam War lasted for almost 20 years, right? But um, Saturn and Aries, between 68 to 71, 
um, there was a really strong point of America's involvement in the war. That's when a lot of the protests were happening in America, right? A lot of the major big protests as far as trying to get America to stop its involvement in war was in that it was in that time frame. And that means Saturn would have been in America's fifth house. Right? So that means that the fifth house, right, is the house of um your parliament, right? Mm -hmm. Um it's the house of um dealing with the uh like uh the makers of the law. Right? Not you would think it would be the ninth house, but it's also the fifth house as well. And so, when the, you understand that the planet in there is going, that Saturn is going to literally create resistance, pressure, right, on you know the morals and the ruler, the morals of you know of of the country. Um, you know, it, it's it's funny because Saturn in the fifth house opposes the eleventh, and eleventh house is the house of also it's a house of social networking groups, large large organizations, and so again Saturn putting the pressure on that eleventh from the fifth to eleventh house, it definitely right, definitely. I mean, the fifth house would be like the Senate, if you will. Yeah. Right. Like the people that kind of make the rules, right? So. That, and that's that's basically who has the ability to go to war without the president, of course, acting emergency powers. Yeah. Senate is the one that goes to war, and Senate is your fifth house. So the people were oppressing, the people were fighting the people. So Saturn in that fifth house and being in Aries, which is debilitated, Saturn is the, it's one of the worst placements because it does create a major problem, even in an, a, a, a mundane, from a mundane perspective to a NATO perspective. Saturn and Aries is somewhat challenging. Yeah. So, not only that, right, between 68 to 71, right, of course, MLK was assassinated and so forth. They had the Nigerian Civil War, Vietnam War is in its height. Um, you also have, between 1998 and 2001, right, you had the Congo, the Second Congo War, and the Second Congo War, five point four million people died. It was the second bloodiest. It was the bloodiest war since World War Two. Yep. Well, you had that in World War Two too. Exactly. Yep. I was about to say, piggyback or to to veggie back or to jump on that one, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Saturn was in Aries during that period of time as well, and Mars was so, exalted. And so here you go. So Mars is able to bring it, and then you got Pluto in opposition to Mars for a good. I mean, for you know, for, for a period of time. Yeah. Because Mars takes forty five days to change signs. So you see what I mean? Then you can begin to see. Okay, there are some patterns that is just obvious that when Saturn is debilitated, the world is unstable. Hmm. Right. The planet of stability is un, is is at its least stable. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, those are planetary placements that you can just always get in, look for, chime in on, and go right in and say, you know what, yep, I see something coming, especially in this particular nation's chart or in this particular person's chart. Now, the thing about reading mundane astrology is you have to know the houses. Now, the other thing <coughs> I wanted to mention in light of this is that Mars being in certain positions in the chart of a nation also can create war. Hmm. So if Mars is conjunct the NATO Mars, which is debilitated in a nation's chart, they could definitely have the propensity to create some, some disturbances in that nation and with the nations that are surrounding it. Right? So you always want to look for the planetary placements within a, within a nation's chart. If the planet itself, if Mars is within 1, 4, 7, or 10, you have a good chance that something aggressive is going to happen. Again, either defense or offense, mm. but it's it could potentially occur. Why? First house is what the physical chart of the, the it's the physical body being represented as the chart, which we saw in nine eleven, right? Mars in the fourth house. Fourth house is your homeland, so there might be internal fights, 
are fighting internally, like a civil war or like some type of uh, um, two-sided thing where people, you know, uh, that are going back and forth as far as uh, aggression or fighting. Mars in the seventh house, which is in opposition to the ascendant of the chart, which then still lends those powers to be in opposition to that particular nation by way of treaties, uh, uh, business deals, something could, could trigger war from that perspective. Uh, something going wrong in regards to contracts or uh, foreign policy. Yeah. The tenth house is the house of the ruler itself. Now, Mars does well in the tenth. So typically, if there was some type of ad, uh, adversity, that nation usually will have the upper hand unless the other nation itself has some other placements that may be able to counteract a lot of that. But Mars in the tenth creates a lot of power for any nation at any given time. And again, we have to look at the other planets to make sure those other planets are conditioned to support the long-term aspects of war. Because war is not something typically these days you just do. It's something that has to be has to, go, has to be vetted and goes through a process. Yeah. And for most nations, but nonetheless, Mars in those major key positions. Now, Mars in the sixth house can also have some similarities. Some, and Mars in the twelfth house can also be subversions from foreign enemies. War, hidden wars from from um, um, foreign enemies. Mm. Right, so right, then that's how you begin to look at the chart. Okay, okay, now I see. So if you got Saturn in the sixth house, Mars in the twelfth of a nation's chart, there's a good possibility espionage is all over the place, and so and espionage can also be the eighth house as well. Mm. But the six eight, six eight, the the six twelve combination or opposition, the twelfth house is foreign powers. Yeah, right. So, you know, this is how we begin to look at a chart to see, okay, did Mars conjunct, right, the NATO Saturn of this chart, and how long will it be? Will it go retrograde over that? Did Saturn conjunct the NATO Mars of a chart? Did K2 conjunct it? <laughs> right? You begin to look for triggers in that chart. Now, the other thing is you want to take note of is you want to look at the leaders of the nations because their charts also have an impact. On the destiny of the nation right and so as we see around us right in America right Donald Trump is the pulse of the nation right now his chart is the one that we are experiencing through this impeachment yeah we're experiencing Donald Trump right now through his chart I mean if you sit back and kind of think that's pretty deep because <laughs> it's like whoever's in the throne it it's an old movie called Excalibur I don't know if you're, you're probably too you might, no right? I, remember, I, remember, I remember that yeah, yeah 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 remember the king is connected to the land so when the king something wrong with the king the land is all toe up ain't nothing growing right it's the same in fact even in Kemet the king is connected to the land the Nile right yeah Hapi Right, so the Nasut is literally he's he's the vehicle for the nation's you know health and wealth. This is something we've always known, right? So the leader of a nation has to the, 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 that chart has to be looked at, right? And guess what? Good old Donald Trump, right? Where is so he's Leo ascendant, right? Saturn is leaving. The fifth house, mm -hmm. and I discussed it previously on a podcast that the fifth house is the fall from power. You're witnessing that Saturn transiting the fifth house right now. <laughs> All these planets are bunching up in the fifth house, almost to create a swelling as if. It's to explode something. So, and he tried to look as calm and cool as he won't. <laughs> In the back of his mind, I'm telling you, he's stressed. Yeah. He's stressed. So, and I wrote an article, a little brief little, not an article, but a brief little something on Facebook, I kind of reposted it today, because, you know, the verdict in is in, he is, 
technically going up for impeachment. And so, that being the case, astrology, two years ago, right, I already saw this coming. I When I saw it and read it in the chart, it was clear as day. He would be impeached. So, that being said, right, you can clearly see how you have to look at all these different factors and add them in to really properly assess if war is going to abound. But once you do, and once you see the patterns repetitiously over and over and over again, then you begin to say, okay, you know what, yeah, definitely I can look to see where Mars and Saturn is, or I can definitely see where Mars and Uranus is, or Mars and Pluto, or whatever the case is, you can see that it's going to come. And when you know that that planet, let's say for example, like for America, America has four planets in the seventh house. So anytime a planets are in the first house, those planets in the seventh house are being majorly affected. Yeah. <clears throat> and we are that's how I knew he would be impeached. Because the seventh house deals in the balancing of things. So if it's being balanced and there's Saturn there with K2, and I look at his chart, the leader of the nation, and say, Oh, well that's in his fifth house. Ooh. Yeah. That's not going. That's not looking good for you, boy. Yeah. So, you know, what I mean, it's just you begin to see those patterns, and once you look at it, you you'll catch it quickly. So the next person, and when we're talking about elections, on a, a show coming up here soon, it's been quite interesting to see how this thing, the process, has worked because we know that they're duly selected, not elected, but how they're weeding out whoever they want to have as the next selectee. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's interesting, and they're weeding. They've weeded out. Mr. Trump, he's weeded out. Hmm. Right? Already. Just this alone weeds him out. You know, um, the funny thing is, is not too long um, after the next election, um, you know, Saturn and Mars, you know, they go into opposition again. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you. <laughs> and I'm Mars would be you. debilitated. Look, man, <laughs> just watch. Mm. And it may not be America, right? That may be some other country. Yeah. Right? But just pay close attention. Because then you'll say, oh, and you, if you have the, the, the chart of the country, or even the chart of the leader, if you don't have the chart of the country, do the chart of the leader. And you will see in that, there is, you know, destiny is intertwined. It just is, you know, it's woven. So, by that person being in that position alone, the impact that he has, not only on the, the nation and on the chart itself of the nation, but just period alone, him sitting in that position, everyone is going to experience his issues or his challenges or his triumphs. And so just looking at that chart alone would lend a lot of power, predictive power, on what's to come for a nation. And the funny thing, when you look at it, so in his chart, a little bit after the election, they be, um their opposition, um, Saturn and Mars's opposition from um, six and twelfth house. Mm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then in yeah. the United yeah. States chart is the uh, eighth and second. Yeah, and so that's I mean, if you think about the election, how the election went, what did they say was the what did they? How did they say the election went, or who was the culprit behind the election? Supposedly, I'm just saying. Russia. You know, the conjecture, huh? R- Russia, 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 right? And which house is the house of espionage? Not just the twelfth. Eighth. The eighth house. Isn't that something? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I mean? And I'm not saying they did or didn't. I really don't care. Cause yeah. It ain't going to change that anyway. But to understand and know and be able to foresee and look into the spiritual matters of things gives you a great keen sense of how things, how the supreme being is under complete control. Yeah. All these things have been already there to exercise certain activities so that as a, as a being, we grow. And we, we see things. We see mistakes. We see... I mean, I don't even see this voting system being here in the next 20 years. I don't know about you, but I don't think it can sustain itself at this rate. 
Yeah, it's just in gonna, this way. It's going to get interesting. Definitely interesting, to say the least. So, you know, that's generally what we'll discuss today. Um, but, you know, again, like I said, there's always other factors. Um, we didn't even talk about how to look at an actual chart in regards to the lords of those certain houses that also can create wars. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just, you know, this, this science is vast. Um, there's a, an astrologer by the name of James Braha. Um, he wrote some pretty decent books on astrology, on, on Jyotish. And one of the things he said, he was like, you know, predictive power is only 75 to 80% at best. Mm -hmm. Right? And he's right. I mean, because, number one, man, you know, man has a will. Notice I didn't say a free will. A will. And that allows him to navigate and control the lower nature to defer to the higher, which then at some point when he does it well enough and long enough, allows him to interface and actually manipulate his destiny in some ways. But for the most part, most of us haven't achieved that level of self-mastery, so we're subject to the forces that be. Yeah. Right. And we try to mitigate them as much as possible. And we can once you know yourself, once you know that you're the supreme. But, you know, again, that's, that's far removed from most people. So, you know, when you look at this, it, 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 we're, we're reading it from a very um, probable perspective not just possible because anything's possible is it probable and if it's probable i should see some what we call um, um confluence meaning there should be more than one factor repeating itself so you just you just you just did that right number one we had k2 in the ascendant in 9 11 Number two, we had Mars in the Ascendant on 9-11. And now Mars and K2 are conjoined, which is another factor. So we got three. Mm -hmm. Then you said Saturn is in the six, and the six, eight. Now we got four. So there's confluence all through America's chart, and confluence creates events. Yeah. Right. So that's what we have to do is use all of the things, the tools that we have, the things I mentioned, plus things I haven't, to really come to a strong consensus and say, so, you know what? It's about 80%. Our 80% out of the 80, it's 100% of that 80 that it's going to happen. Anything, of course, can throw it off because, like I said, we have a will. And man using his will can change the course of destiny to a degree. Right. But that's it, brother. What you, you got any questions or anything you want to add in or drop on the people? I think we gave this subject enough energy <laughs> right now. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, um, like I always do, I want to remind you that uh, this show, this episode was brought to you by Push It Forward Media Group and Calaprusha Astrology. Um, you know, make sure you go follow us on Instagram and go, you know, hit up Brother Rod, get in the consultation queue. You know, um, that, that long wait list that he got going on there and, <laughs> you know, get that all together. Um, and, um, make sure you go follow us and, um, whatever you're listening to this on, make sure you subscribe, you know, make, make sure you subscribe. That helps us to, you know, grow the show, you know, and, um, you know, we'll, you know, definitely, um, you know, um, bring some things about for our subscribers, you know, um, so yeah, I think I think we're good, man. Like I said, I don't, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do, but you know, we'll we'll try to, you know, use our, our collective powers to try to, you know, move those um, war potentials, you know, another way. <laughs> you know. Well, you know, the thing about it is, there, um, you know, I don't know if you you've heard of transcendental meditation before. Yeah. Right. Um, there was some studies, and uh, I'll have it next time I come back on the show, um, but there were some studies that actually does show that meditation, group meditations in large numbers can shift events. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, I mean, you know, our power is not, not powerless, right? We're just ignorant of our power. <laughs> and when you don't know you got power, you know, you, you def it's a, you're you're a, you default to whatever's around you. 
And so if people in mass, you're talking about, you know, 100 people, 200 people, 300 people, sit down, have the same visualization, the same breath rate, the same posture, the same focus, absolutely can turn the tides of destiny. But how far and few is that in reality? It's just unfortunate. It's not something that is... And I mean, just think about it like this. If we did that in mass as a planet, oh my God, what kind of power would we have? <laughs> <coughs> I mean, then, then, at, then at that point, you might be able to traverse the stars to have that kind of oneness within, you know, man. That would be phenomenal if we could get to that level. It may be, you know, maybe not to that level, but even close to that level. Yeah. You could take a, a, a comet on its way and move it out the way. I mean, it just that kind of power is at man's disposal. But, you know, because you know, our Scythian-like nature creates this separation process that we have, you know, then, hey, you know, we, we're stuck where we are and until something massive enough w- wakes up man as a totality, then we might we might use that that ability but nonetheless we will definitely send out positive energy and visualize you know hopefully you know if anything were to come the avoidance of that event absolutely absolutely well you know um that's been this week's show um you know uh, I told you last show it might be a little unconventionality right here at the end so uh we have some surprises for you you know, coming into that last week. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, uh, Brother Rod, you got anything else you got to say? Uh, no, it's the, if you all, this is the, the best way to be interactive with the show is, of course, ask questions. Uh, send send me um, DMs if you have any questions. And many of you do, and I do appreciate it. And it's, you know, I I'm never too busy to answer a question. You may not get the immediate response you might be looking for, but give me a little time. I'll definitely get to you, and we definitely will wrap and build. Um, but I do say, you know, ask questions, but also, you know, um, bring requests that you have. Uh, people have been doing that. I really appreciate it. It gives me something to do to research on because coming up with the topics, I mean, I could we'll be here forever but it, it, it's good when the people are learning something they want to learn about or someone they want to learn about so if you're interested in that people have dropped some ideas uh, and we we're going to be doing them in fact we're going to be doing some coming up shortly um, you know hit me up hit hit up hit up uh, hit up the podcast and let us know you know what you want to see or who you want to see uh, provided we can get a good time frame y'all I mean I have to throw that in there because um, not every chart we can't do every chart because not every chart has a solid time but if it has a solid time we'll do it so um drop us a line now and that's that's it for me indeed 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 so um you know appreciate you all listening to this episode episode 23 and um you know we'll 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 lock in on the next episode all right so we're out peace peace